bless you, brothers and sisters, tonight. You know, for who's all here in this, I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. And you know, tonight, before we start, say or do anything tonight, I'd ask us to bow our heads in prayer and ask that the Lord Jesus would speak to us tonight, that he'd give us ears that we could hear and a heart and mind that we could understand the message of the gospel tonight. For the faith comes by hearing the word of God. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you this night, my God, in the name of Jesus, my God. And we ask you, O Lord God of heaven, my God, that you would move this night, my God, that you would save, heal and deliver, my God. Set free, my God, Lord, the broken heart, my God, Lord. Deliver, my God, those who need delivered, my God. But most of all, my God, save the lost and set them free, Lord God. Let them come to know the God of the Bible, my God, who changes lives, my God. And we ask this, my God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And the children of God says, Amen. Do you know, tonight I just want to keep you eight, nine minutes, ten minutes tops, and I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Now, the word gospel simply means the good news of Jesus. And you may say, well, what's this good news about? What's so good about this Jesus Christ? What's so good about this God of the Bible? Well, the God of the Bible that I'm talking about tonight is not the God of religion. Many people talk about religion to me. Do you know, tonight I'm not trying to offer you a religion, and tonight I'm not offering you it. But tonight I'm telling you about the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ. The God who took on flesh, the God who put the stars in the sky with his very fingertips, who made the moon, the sun, the oceans, and made the world in six days. This is the God that raises the dead, the Bible says. The God who gives sight to the blind, who makes the lame walk and the mute talk. This is the God that I'm speaking about tonight. This is the God in 1 Corinthians 15, and the whole house council of God is this, that he died, he rose three days later, and he lives forevermore. This is the God that I'm speaking about tonight. And you know, there's a question I want to put out tonight, I was walking there overnight, and I was thinking... And it's a true fact, you know, there is life beyond the grave. There is life beyond the grave that the grave is not the end. Do you know, so many of us think of us that we'll live life for 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 years. But we're not much time after that that others won't see 100. And we'll achieve so many things in life and we just die and we go to a cemetery and we get buried and that's the end. That would, If that was the case and that's how it was, it wouldn't be so bad just to be buried, fall asleep and never wake up. But friend, that is not the case. Because the grave is not the end. The grave is not the end for mankind, but just the beginning of life. See, this world that we live in, we only pass through for 60, 70, 80, 90 years. And when we die, there's two places we can go to. The Bible speaks about heaven and the Bible speaks about hell. There is no middle ground. When one man dies or the whole earth dies, you can either go to one place or the other. But that determines upon where you decide to go. Where you decide you want to go. Now I want to read a scripture in the Bible. And the best example of this can be found in Luke 16 verses 22. And just to gather the story for you. It speaks about two men. It speaks about a rich man. And it speaks about Lazarus. Now Lazarus was a God-fearing man. A beggar never had much but he knew the Lord. And we have one rich man who thought he was okay the way he was. I've got my bits of things. I don't need nobody. I've done it my whole life my own way. Nobody taught me or gave me anything. And the Bible says that the two men died. Now, this is the example I want to put out there. A true story within the word of God. This is not a parable, but a true story. And it says this. The time come when the beggar died. And the angel carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died. And he was buried in Hades. Buried in hell. This rich man was buried in hell. See, we have two men here. Two men with the same equally chance. Two men born and lived upon the earth. Two men who lived and grew up, see, but one man knew the offer of life. One man knew Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. And another man thought, well, I'm okay the way I am. Because in the book of the Proverbs, it's Proverbs 14, it says, it's a way that seems right to man. And in the end, it would lead to death. So let's speak about the rich man, because there's so many people in the world today think, well, I'm okay the way I am. Why do I need God for? I've never done nothing to upset nobody. I'm not a bad person. I'm not like A, B and C because we have a problem with travelling people. We categorise sin. We base ourselves on other people. It's called self-righteousness. Do you know I want to put that theory to bed tonight because within the Holy Scriptures of God's Word, any Bible in the world, you know, this is a traveller's Bible, and this is God's Word, the Holy Bible. It says in Romans 3 and 23 that for all of sins, and all has fall short of the glory of God. A double L. All has fall short of the glory of God. All is sinners. The Bible says through one man's disobedience, Adam in the garden, that sin come to all men. We're all under the curse of sin. It was a curse that was passed down from generation to generation to generation. If you want to go through breeding generations and who your breed is, you'll take you back to the Garden of Eden. To Adam and Eve, your great granny and granddad. And we've all sinned. See, man can sin in three ways. 
for the direction. You may say, well, I've never did nothing really wrong. I'm not really that bad person. I've never murdered nobody. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever wished someone dead within your heart and meant it? Well, Jesus says in the book of Matthew that you're a murderer. Have you ever took something that doesn't belong to you? It's called chore and it makes you a thief. If you've took something regardless of the price, if it's a thousand pound, ten pound or fifty pence, if you're going to pay for that, that makes you a thief. Liars. If you tell a lie, you're a liar. There's three of commandments that I've named off tonight. That makes you a liar, a thief and a murderer. It doesn't look good. Do you know the Bible says that all wrongdoing is sin? You know, you can you can fancy it up, you can sugarcoat it up and say, well, I, I don't see it that way, regardless of what way you see it and what way I see it, doesn't really matter. It's the way that God's word sees it, because the Bible says, let God be true and all men be liars. God is the truth. God is the way and God is the life. And if you say, I'm all right the way I am, I don't really need God for my life, I'll do it my way. You may can live on for a long time, but you're still a sinner. In regards of who you are, what breed you come from, we've all sinned. There's no righteous upon the face of the earth. See, there's a price to sin. There's a wager upon your life. Now, the word sin means this, is to miss the mark. When you get, uh, years ago, when they used to have arrows and they would shoot them at a target, and it would miss. It would be sin, they have missed the mark. And we have missed the mark, we are not perfect. See, there's a dress code to heaven, and the dress code is this, perfection. God requires perfection, and the problem is, we have missed the mark in perfection. If you like, we are flawed. We are flawed. We are broken and we need a saviour. But when you say, I'm all right the way I am, these Christians are taking it too far. Go to the Bible, go to the word of God. There's no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. See, the problem that is today is so many people have a travelling God. They are a God of religion, a God of their own God, but listen to live a lifestyle of their own way. Friend, let me tell you some what it says in Revelations. In Revelation 21 verse 8, it says that all liars would go to the lake of fire. Murderers, adulterers, drinkers would all go to the lake of fire. See, let me tell you something, you don't have to be like Hitler to be a sinner. You don't have to be a good sinner or a bad sinner because God said sin is sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this, but that your sin, your sin, the word book was there, but your sin has separated you from your God. You can say, well, I thought Jesus loved me. He does love you. He died for you. He adores you. But the problem is because of your sin that you never dealt with it and you never handed it over. And you said, I'm okay the way I am. That one day when you would die, like this rich man, he said he died and he was buried in a place called Hades, the place of hell. Go to the word of God and read about it. I'm not bringing the scare card out tonight, but I'm bringing the truth. And when we look into this place, it says there was weeping, there was gnashing of teeth. It says the fire would never go out. The worm would never die. Where he was in torment and suffering and flames and anguish. And the other fact of the matter is he couldn't get out. He says to Father Abraham, he saw the distance, he said, please get me out of this place. He says, I can't get you out of it. He said, nobody can cross from here to there. There's a chasm between us. We can't get to you. He said, please. He says, send, La he says, send Lazarus to give me a drip of water upon my tongue. This is the same Lazarus that he didn't want to know when he was alive, who he despised. He says, send them to give me a drink of water. He said, it can't happen. He said, I have five brothers and a family. Send someone to tell them. He says, they have the word of God and the prophets. And do you know today that man is 2,020 year on. He's still in this place called Hades. He's still in burning suffering and he still can't get out. He still can't get to warn his family. I don't know where that man's family went because if they never repented and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they would never get to heaven. See, you might say that's a bit harsh, but that's the truth. It's not good people that go to heaven. It's repented people who goes to heaven, who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that they believe Jesus died for them. They're the ones that go to heaven. You may say, how do I know this? Because the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the very world, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, I'm a twin. I have an identical twin brother. Jesus was not a twin. God didn't have two sons, three sons, but he had one son. And this is the very God who made all things. And he sent his son from heaven to earth to be born in a stable in Bethlehem, not Buckingham Palace. And he grew up and he walked and talked and did miracles. But you know the world, the world didn't like the truth. And we have the same problem today because truth exposes us. See, the truth is hard to take, but it's the best way. It's beneficial. If you go to the doctor and he says, take this pill, it might not taste nice, but it will cure you. If it doesn't taste nice, it will still cure it. And that's what the gospel does. It cures us. It brings life, it brings healing, it brings life and salvation. Jesus Christ, you say, well, how did he love me? How much did he love me? He loved you enough to die for you. He loved you enough to go to the cross for you. 
Do you know they took Jesus Christ and they took him to a place called Antonio's Fortress. I've been to this place many times. Look it up in the scriptures. And then they took a whip of nine tails. Now picture this. The very God who made heavens and earth in six days, who placed everything into being, was the very God that would hold and they'd take a whip of nine tails and they would scourge his back. Over seven layers of skin bust open. The blood would be everywhere. It would be like a massacre. The Bible says he did not resemble that of a human. That all his bones was on display. It says the ploughman ploughed my back and he ploughed it hard. When they would take him there, they show a crown of thorns into his head. When they would make him carry his own cross, an old drug and horrible cross, up a road called the Suffering Way, the Via Della Rosa, to the place of Calvary, to the place of the skull, where they would take the very Son of God and they would nail him hand and feet to a cross. How much did he love you? He loved you this much when he went to the cross because while Jesus was on the cross, you were on his mind. He took your place. He took your punishment. Why? Because the Bible says he was pierced for our transgressions and he was bruised for our sins and iniquity. He took your place at the cross. When you say, what did Jesus ever do for me? He demonstrated his love in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago because by we were sinning, Jesus Christ was dying for us. Jesus Christ was taking our place. Can I ask you, what was going on in heaven that day, tell me? What would God the Father must have been thinking when he looked upon his son that didn't resemble a human? What would the angels be thinking when they were looking to the Father? Jesus said he could call upon 12 legions of angels to come to his dispute, but to disposal to rescue him. Now I did the math, I could be wrong, don't quote me, but I think that was 64,000 angels suited and booted and ready to rock. But do you know what happened? It never worked that way because the Bible says it pleased the Father in Isaiah 53 verse 10 to crush the son. It pleased the Father. Why? Because Jesus Christ became our sin bearer. He took our road. He took the cup of wrath. So we could receive the cup of mercy and blessings. He took your place that day in Calvary. How could you not say that Jesus doesn't love you when he died for you? But you know, friend, not only did he die for you. The Bible says he died upon a cross. He pronounced him dead. They took him down. They placed him in a tomb. But do you know, glory to God, the God that I serve today is a risen saviour. Because the Bible says that three days later, he rose from the grave. He conquered death and he lives forevermore. I do not serve a dead God, but my God is a risen God. In fact, the book of Hacks puts it even better. When Stephen was being stoned to death, he said he looked to heaven and he saw God the Father and God the Son standing side by side. My God is not dead, but he's alive. What am I getting at? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I can do all things through him. And because he lives, he can help me in every situation. So the question is this tonight, what are you going to do about Jesus Christ? Are you going to accept him as your Lord and Saviour? Because you know you say, well I don't know how to do it. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ would die for your sin, that he was put on the ground and he was three days, he put on a tomb and he was rose three days later and he lives forevermore, you can be saved. Acts 2, 21, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. Do you know there's no other gospel? There's no other way to heaven. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. I don't care for religion or all, all these other things. It's what the Bible says. A man must be born again. In John 3, 7, it says, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. Are you born again? Are you saved? Do you know the God of the Bible who saves, heals, and delivers? Do you know today you might say, well, I, you don't know where I've been. I've had a hard life. I struggle with depression. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ can break the chains of depression. Because the Bible says whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Do you need to be set free from alcohol tonight? Do you need to be set free from anxiety, pain, suffering, drink, alcohol? I don't know, but let me tell you something. Jesus Christ can set you free by because he is the author of life. Who have you met with? So many people meet with men, they meet with missions, they meet with religion, they meet with denominations. But do you want to know something? I met with the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, nine and a half years ago, and he changed my life. You know, I'm quite aware tonight you don't need Jesus Christ to buy a nice house in the yard. You don't need Jesus Christ to go and buy a shirt or a watch or a set of shoes. But understand this point here. You need Jesus Christ to get to heaven. For he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No other name under heaven was given unto man for which we must be saved. But by the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, tell me. Who else died in those three days later? Nobody else but Jesus Christ. That's how I know he lives. That's how I know I'm going to heaven. I know tonight if Lewis went to drop stone dead behind this pulpit, that the Bible says to be absence for the body is to be presence with the Almighty God. I'll be like Lazarus. I will go to my father and I will live with him forevermore on streets of solid gold. No more pain, suffering or tearing. But I pity the man and woman who says, I know my own God. I've got my own way. For absence for the body with them will be the next thing, the thing they would taste is a mouth full of fire. They would go to the place of hell. Do you know you might say, brother, that's quite harsh, but let me tell you something, that's the truth. 
Within the 66 books of the Bible, there's only one road into salvation, into heaven, is through Jesus Christ tonight. Who do you have tonight? Do you know if you're being set free, Jesus Christ can set you free. Do you know, God bless you, my brothers and sisters, who visited this year. And you know, I beg you, you can never be too old, you can never be too young, but you can be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, the Bible says, do not harden your hearts. Accept him. Do you know, tomorrow's promise to no man. Well, not promise the next 10 minutes. But by you are alive and well today. Confess, say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and Saviour. Please forgive me and help me to walk you all the days of my life. Say that prayer tonight. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Then get a Bible. Then go to a church when it opens. And then begin just to explore the God of the Bible. Let me tell you something. It will change your life if you allow him to. God bless.